Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. This is your host, Jeff Lerner, uh, coming to you from a hotel today. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it's a little different backdrop, hopefully good quality recording. I think it's working okay. Today, I am joined, actually, I'm excited today. I'm always excited, but I'm especially excited today. I'm joined by a good friend of mine, Paul Getter. And I love bringing friends on the show because I get to like ask them about all the stuff that I never asked them, you know, that I probably always wondered about and never got, never thought to ask, or maybe there was no, no right way to do it. But anyway, uh, Paul, I'll, t- I'll just share how I know Paul and we'll, we'll get into Paul's extensive history but you know I basically started working with Paul I was connected to him actually he can maybe refresh me on how we were connected but he's a he's essentially a a marketing consultant to some of the biggest names and and most you know I don't know wealthiest and most successful influencers on the whole internet Paul's the genius I think the self-proclaimed nerd in many cases behind some of those brands and uh, I retained him in that same way, and we've gotten to be good friends. We've collaborated in a number of ways, and he's just a genius, but also a great guy. Paul Getter, welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Hey, thanks a lot, Jeff. No, you you are awesome. You're awesome. I mean, you're you're oh. a rock star. It's a oh, privilege geez. to be on your show with you. So uh, <laughs> let, let let me let me let me just say, Jeff is an amazing guy. Jeff has done world renowned marketing and entrepreneurship changing the lives of millions of individuals around the around the I'm sorry Jeff can't read your handwriting here so um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm Dude, kidding. I was no. like, is he serious? Wow. That, that was good. The way you brought that home. That was really, this is why Paul is Paul, man. He's, he's, he's the real deal here. Um, but so maybe you can remind me, like, how did we actually get connected? Do you remember? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, man, I, I think I was working with a, a client that, you know, gave our name to you I don't even really remember exactly who it was, but you know how it is. Just kind of like the internet marketing world. Someone says, Hey, you need to meet this guy. You need to talk to this guy. And next thing you know, we're talking, we're we're doing stuff together and I had the privilege of actually meeting you in person at the uh, click funnels live conference, which was really cool. So, but no, all all honesty, uh, Jeff, you are an amazing person and I admire you. I mean, you've up there on stage with all those big X plaques and, and you're a legend in the industry. Well, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, from you, thank you. I'm, I'm humbled. Like, you, you know, you, I will say this, you're someone who knows legends because you're, like I said, you're the, the mastermind and the, the, in many cases, probably the unheralded wizard behind some of these legends of the, you know, business education and entrepreneurial influencer industry. Um, And yeah, I I don't, I I still don't remember who introduced us, but I I know I'm glad they did. And I know that uh, we've, we've had a lot of fun working together and I'm looking forward to future, future ventures together as well. Um, When I was prepping for this though, obviously I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to, I'm going to get to have a little different conversations with Paul than I usually have. You know, usually we're talking about, you know, growth hacking trends or sure. uh, marketing campaign ROAS or, you know, all this, yeah. all this nerd speak that we both love, but there's a, there's a human side to this too. And, and, you know, I, you sent over your, your bio, which I had read before. And, you know, I know we've talked about how you used to, uh, used to deliver phone books, right? Out yeah. of your, yeah. out of your, your <laughs> minivan. And, and it kind of got me thinking, it's like, you know, this whole internet uh, commerce, internet entrepreneurship thing, you know how like those shows like The Walking Dead or uh, oh, there's, there was one like called The Stand by Stephen King and there's like there's these like post-apocalyptic shows about these yeah. 
bands of people and they're, you know, they're just warriors. They're out there fighting zombies. But the interest of the show is when you start to tease into the backstories of all these people, like, Oh, before the apocalypse, he was a house painter and he was a, he was a police officer. And I kind of feel like the digital economy, uh, you know, that's kind of thrust a lot of us into, I guess, either the, whether it's the forefront or just a, a different phase of our lives where we have a lot of success and stuff going on. And like the backstories are what are so cool. It's kind of like those shows. Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, like, you know, I used to be a jazz piano player. You used to deliver phone books. Like, yeah. um, almost, almost like, the same thing, almost it, the same thing. It really is. <laughs> so I want to, I want to hear, I want this to be the episode about Paul's story. Like how, yeah. How, how the heck did you go from, because reality is if, if, you know, you think about the people listening to this, uh, probably more of them relate to, in my case, the guy sleeping in his ex-wife's parents' house. In your case, the guy delivering phone books, like more people probably relate to that than like, sure. Oh yeah. I run, uh, I run, you know, Instagram ads for Ty Lopez or something like most people don't, they don't know what that means or looks like. And so let's maybe connect those dots. I feel like that'd be really valuable. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't always the internet marketing lifestyle. Right. Uh, I I guess you would say that I kind of grew up as an entrepreneur, even as a young kid. And maybe some people don't understand this, but there used to be a day that we would hustle. We would go door to door. We would, you know, me and my friend would knock on uh, neighborhood doors asking if we could mow their lawn for five dollars, delivering newspapers, you know, doing whatever we could to make a dollar, and uh, you know, so that was that was my introduction to the entrepreneurial lifestyle. And uh, my father, he was he was quite an entrepreneur too. You know, he was actually, I guess you could say, a agricultural entrepreneur. Hmm. Um, this was before it was legal. Uh, so <laughs> hold on. Do I think I know where you're going with this? <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Jeff, uh, I was probably about nine or 10 years old. And I remember my dad was out in the backyard and he was paying very special, close attention to these large plants taller than me, probably six, seven feet tall. And he was watering them, fertilizing, clipping the leaves off and things were, like Were they that. the color of money by chance? They, they were, they, they were, were, yeah. They were yeah. big green plants. Okay, I think I know yeah, where you're going with this. They were green plants. And, and I remember I was hanging over his shoulder and he kind of shrugged me off and he said, son, go inside, stay away from these. And I said, I looked at him like, oh, why do I have to stay away from them? He's like, they're poison ivy, stay away from them. And I was like, I remember walking away and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why is dad watering the poison ivy? Why is he taking <laughs> such, <laughs> well, I later figured out it was a different type of weed. Right, uh, right. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, and again, that was before it was legal, but uh, outside, outside of that, my, my parents, they instilled within me, um, you know, work hard, work hard. You know, they didn't just give me anything. And so, you know, I found myself, I actually, I went to college. I went to college, got my degree in theology, which, you know, a lot of times someone that goes to college to get a degree in theology, they don't necessarily go to, you know, hey, I'm going to get a degree in theology and make a lot of money. Right. Um, that's not the, the case in that by any means. But so when I graduated from college, I realized that a degree in theology wasn't very marketable at all. Uh, so I found myself kind of bouncing around working odd jobs and, uh, delivering phone books was one of them. Probably some people don't even know what a phone book is. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, uh, but yeah, me and my family, we were, um, every evening we would load up my, uh, minivan with phone books and just deliver door to door. These big, thick, I mean, my bumper was dragging the ground. Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah. And uh, we did that, I think for like 40 or $50 a night, uh, but it was whatever we could do to make ends meet. And that's honestly, that's really an important aspect of the entrepreneurship is that you're not afraid to hustle and grind and just do whatever it takes to get the job done. And when you say we, uh, you're talking wife, you're talking kids, like who's we? The, 
my wife, my kids. Matter of fact, I had one of my good friends. He was with me. He had his van loaded up. Uh, he had his uh, kids with him. And we would basically, we would, we'd have the van, the vans loaded down with phone books and give them to the kids and they'd run them to the door, drop them to the door. And we would go door to door just like that. So, uh, so yeah, I got the whole family working. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I mean, I, I um, uh... I pl- yeah, I mean, first of all, I, pl- <laughs> I, I can kind of relate. I, I suspect your theology degree was worth about as much as my jazz piano degree. In the, uh, <laughs> Arts in the degrees are, are like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I also think there's something probably pretty poignant and relevant about that where, you know, because I think as an entrepreneur, it's not like, so, I mean, there's a lot more MBAs than there are, successful entrepreneurs. It's so true. So it's true. not about, Oh, well, well, what were you, what were you taught in, in an academic setting? It's more right. like, who did you become and why do you do what you do? Yeah. And in that sense, I would say there's probably more correlation between somebody who is driven by maybe a, a zeal for like spirituality or faith or religion yeah. or being a messenger of the good news or a, yeah, you know, a yeah. disruptor, like almost like a, an apostleship type of mindset versus, yeah. versus being like a, you know, a corporate box checker who's maybe got a ton of credentials. Like it doesn't surprise me at all that a jazz musician and a, the, and a theology major. And I know you're, you do a lot of like still like pastoral kind of work to this day that, that we're two guys talking about being really successful online entrepreneurs, as opposed to like, maybe a guy with a law degree and an MBA talking about, yeah, well, I used to make six figures in the corporate world. And then I switched over to this gig. Like those guys typically don't come over to this side. That's true. They that think they so have true. it good over there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and plus yeah. they, they, they know that, you know, well, I don't, I, I don't want to paint be stereotypical, but like, I'm not sure they're doing that for the same reasons that we're doing this or that we were doing what we were doing before this, because for us, it clearly was not originally at least about the money. Yeah. 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 No, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I guess you would say I dabbled around in corporate world. I I did whatever I could to make ends meet. And I remember there was such a, I don't know, an uncomfortable uneasiness of, you know, not being able to control your own schedule, not having that freedom and anybody that's ever experienced it where you go into the entrepreneur life and you're self-employed, granted, there are seasons that you're working 15, 20 hours a day. I remember that. I remember, you know, sleeping four or five hours, waking up and working the entire day until my eyes were heavy and I could barely stay awake. There was times like that. But then there's the season where you um, reap from all of the hard work and you've got freedom. And to look back at a corporate nine to five job, uh, it's almost uh, scary to think about that to me. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, it, it is crazy. Um, I, I'm the same way. I, so you dabbled in corporate jobs. Tell, tell me a little more about those experiences. Yeah, so I worked, uh, I worked sales positions. I worked but one of a, a really interesting Um, feather in my hat. I actually worked as a micro engineer um, making microscopic uh, pieces. Matter of fact, one of the the things that I made was uh, used for the Mars rover. Uh, So some of our clients were NASA, Motorola, things like that. But I was basically working in a lab, microscope and micro equipment and building microscopic pieces. You can imagine how exciting that was. <laughs> <laughs> All your wins were very small wins, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, so I'll tell you, like, for example, we were looking at parts that were the size of one hair split in six pieces, and we had to examine them and make sure there wasn't a scratch on them. Literally. It wasn't a scratch on one sixth of a single strand of hair. <laughs> yeah. So wow. we're, we're, we're using this microscopic equipment to make sure that there isn't a scratch on a one sixth of a hair. So, uh, yeah, that was. Uh, well, so, so, okay. Well, what jumps out at me, though, is 
clearly, you know, they didn't hire you for that because of your theology degree. And yeah. that, but that's not also just some like low skills, you know, manual labor type of endeavor. That's a high skill. A lot of you're, you're surrounded by really expensive equipment. You have yeah. a lot of liability yeah. and responsibility. You got to know what you're doing. How did you learn? How, did you self-educate? So here's the interesting thing about that job. I remember going in for filling out an application. I knew I was completely underqualified for this. I had right. no experience at all. Filled out an application and the CEO of the company it was a small company, probably less than hundred employees. And uh, he came in, got talking with me and um, asked me what my experience is. And it was, it was obvious I had no experience. And then the hiring manager came in and talked with me. And then a few minutes later, they both came back in and they said, Paul, we really like you. You know, you've got a great personality. It seems like you can work good with people. And, you know, they said all kinds of nice things about me. And they said, but you're completely underqualified. You have no experience in this. And we actually have another applicant that has came in today. He has the degree. He has the experience. And we're looking at him. And I said, okay, you know, I, I understand. And uh, then they said, but this is what we want to do. We're going to hire both of you. Mm. And we're, we're going to let you both work the same job, give it two weeks, and whoever we think does better, we're going to keep. And they said, we think we can train you how to do this, you know, and everything. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. So I was pretty excited about it. And so the uh, first week that I was working there, the other gentleman that they hired, his car broke down and he missed a day of work. Mm -hmm. The uh, second day, the second week, uh, he had some other excuses or something like that and missed a couple days. So needless to say, by default, I showed up every day and I ended up working there for about a year uh, at that job. I was the one that was hired for that position. So it was kind of a neat experience. Yeah, and, but and I'll bet you that you learned, I mean, talk about attention to detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't get more detailed than that, right? <laughs> Uh, in detail, you can only see under a microscope. But I mean, it, my guess is, and, and I'm sure you had others, and, you know, if we had more time, I'd, I'd say, give me the exhaustive list of every job and every lesson learned. But I mean, is it fair yeah. to say, like, everywhere you went, you, you, you must have been learning? Because I know who you are now and what you do now. And mm -hmm. it's not just some guy with a theology degree, you know, faking it. Yeah, like, you're a you're a you're a you've earned the title of nerd. Like you have a huge <laughs> amount of knowledge that clearly you've, you've come across authentically along the way and, and probably worked really hard to accumulate. Always, always learning, always learning. You know, I, I worked at uh, Burger King for four hours. <laughs> so wait, all right. <laughs> and, and you and probably learned a lot about yourself in those four hours. <laughs> I learned I did not want to work at Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> worked at, I, I, me and a friend walked in and they were hiring and the uh, manager said, can you start working now? And we're like, yeah, I guess so. He gave us a shirt and started, you know, training us. And right around lunchtime, it got crazy busy. I'm working the drive through day one by myself <laughs> and things are going crazy. My friend is on the grill learning how to make right. burgers and the manager is the only other person in that in that burger king so it's me and two guys <laughs> you know starting this burger king and <laughs> i remember the manager he started yelling and screaming he's like you guys got to do this to me he just wasn't very patient with us and so my friend and i said well we don't think this is for us and so we Gave him our shirt and we walked out. <laughs> and then he was just a one man manager trying to run. <laughs> it was a, it was, a, it was a one man show at Burger King. So, oh, but, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you deliver phone books. You you do this run of you know corporate gigs, making ends meet, whatever you're doing, and then yeah. something clearly switched. And I'm trying not to project my experience onto sure. you or my other guests, but I know it seems like everyone I talk to has like this this moment, this like fork in the road moment where they, yeah. if they zig or they zag, their life changes and they zagged. Yeah. And so all this other stuff happened. Is that how it happened for you? There was like a zag moment. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I was working at a merchant processor company. Okay. 
sales position. Highly and- relevant space, by the way, for <laughs> internet <laughs> marketers to understand <laughs> intimately. I got up, I had an hour conversation with a lady that owns the primary processor we work with yesterday. And, and most of the conversation was me asking her questions because I just want to know what I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. share that experience. But yeah. that's so really I, important for people to know. <laughs> I, was, I was working in a merchant processing company, helping people set up their local businesses on merchant processing accounts and um, was doing well at it. But the only thing that I didn't like about it is the supervisor of that place. Uh, he was this guy that would come in, you know, probably two, three times a week into the office. And when he would come in, he was screaming and yelling, cussing at people and just really an, an angry, bitter guy. He was, the, he was the owner of the company uh, too. And so he would come in, you know, three, four times a week, maybe and yell at everybody and then leave. And I, I mean, when he would leave, everybody was just it was a hostile work environment when he came in. Everybody was upset. I'm going to quit. I, I can't stand him. And, you know, the usual type stuff. And one day he came in, he was yelling at everybody and stuff. And I was like, hi, oh, yeah, well, somebody's got to say something. So I got up, I walked over to him and I said, hey, man, I, I don't know. And I'm, you know me, I'm trying to be nice about it. I'm like, right. hey, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but you're really creating a hostile work environment and people are getting upset. And, you know, and I just try to be nice about it and try to cool him down and show him how everybody was feeling. Well, that didn't go too well. He poked me in the chest. He's like, Paul, you talk to me like that again. I'm going to fire you. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to let him do that. (laughs) So, So I said, well, you know, I quit. And at that time I was dabbling around and kind of building websites, search engine optimization for companies and stuff like that. And um, so it really kind of pushed me in a position where you know, I'd had experiences before where it just kind of felt like, you know, my supervisor controlled my success or how far I could go. And, you know, it put me in a position where somebody else was defining my future for me. Hmm. And I determined at that point was like, okay, I'm going to try to do my own thing. And so that, that was kind of the catalyst that pushed me into, well, it's, it's all in now. Hmm. So, and that was it. And I mean, okay. So you're building some websites, you're doing some SEO. You you actually had clients already? Well, it was, it was one of the, one of those things where, you know, I'd kind of figured out how to build websites and do a little bit of search and optimization. And when somebody would say, Hey, you know, anybody that builds a website, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And it was, you know, $500 build a website. You know, it was, it was a good little side hustle for me. But uh, from there, at this point, Facebook was really in its infancy stages, just kind of a, a relatively new platform. And one of my friends was heading off to college and they said, Paul, you need to get on Facebook. And what, what know, year so was it? I'm Facebook. looking at your bio. Was this like 2009, 2010? To, between 2008, 2009, somewhere around okay. there. Yeah, yeah. Right when I started, by the way. So Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so... It, it, it was one of those where I was like, eh, I don't want to get on Facebook. Sounds like a game. And, you know, back then, you probably remember, it was like Farmville and all that silly oh, yeah. stuff. And, people and were it was playing. mostly college kids. Yeah, all yeah. Up, so, yeah. which is really, really interesting because the demographic has definitely changed. But, mm-hmm. uh, so I got on and I, I remember getting on there and I was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And one of the things I noticed is that occasionally a business would have a Facebook page. Right. And so I decided to set up a Facebook page for our church and, you know, just a little information, kind of our service times and stuff like that. And I remember a few weeks later, someone showed up at church, a a new face, and I got talking to them. I'm like, where did you hear about us from? And they said, oh, we saw you on Facebook. And it was like a light bulb went off. I was like, these are real people. These, uh. they, they came here and it was at that moment I realized that there was a business opportunity in the Facebook world. And understand, Jeff, this is before the term social media marketing agency, right. even internet marketer. It, they were, it didn't exist. Yeah. So, so I began to kind of like reach out to local businesses and say, hey, you know, are you on Facebook and kind of connect with them? And it was like, 
$20 a month from this person, $50 a month here. And I remember years later talking to someone and they said the term social media marketing agency. And I looked back at what I was doing. I was like, huh, I guess that's what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So that's, so at that point, and, and you know, it's funny, man, we, we, I mean, you know, my business Entra, obviously you've been in, consulted yeah. with us on the promotion of that business. So you know it well, but you know, one of the tracks we teach is agency. And, and, and I tell a lot of people, I, you know, it kind of depends on your personality and your natural gifts and all that. But like, if you're a, for lack of a better way to say it, if you're the kind of person that can, can credibly approach and present to a business owner yeah, and you don't, you know, let's call it what it is. You're reasonably well-groomed. Mm -hmm. You're, you don't look a total mess. You speak relatively well. You're not, I mean, we can't look like Paul Getter, most of us, <laughs> but you know, but at least, um, you, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You, you have the disposition to like have a mature conversation yeah. with a business owner and speak to their interests and their needs. And if you're that guy or that girl, yeah. d digital agencies, honestly, maybe the easiest place to start online. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, there's such a huge opportunity there. It is, I hear people ask, is it oversaturated? All you have to do is just go to a local business. This, this is what I suggest. If you're, like, you're interested in starting an agency, easiest way. I used to do this you know, when we did local uh, businesses. We still occasionally work with some local businesses, but for the most part, it's more of the entrepreneur space and stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you go to a restaurant or a local business and they have on their menu or on their door or something like that, the social media icons, Number one, that says that they understand the value of being on social media. Next thing you do is you go and you check out their social media, mm -hmm. you know, f find them. A lot of times what you'll see is they haven't posted in six months. There's nothing going on. Well, that is a prime opportunity for you because number one, you know that they realize it's important enough that they put it on their menus. They've got, uh, you know, displays showing to connect with them on social media, but for some reason, maybe it's they're too busy as business owners that they can't devote the time to do that. Well, that's a perfect client for you. Or maybe they don't really understand how to use it. They know it's important, but they don't know how to utilize it. Again, it's a perfect client for you. So you see that there's an opportunity there. You connect with them. You say, hey, you know, have it. I see you're on social media. Let me tell you what I can do to really help you accelerate the growth, get customers, clients, whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. I think a lot of people don't realize how how really what a low barrier to entry, but yet also accessible yeah. business model that is because you have all these customers that already have pent up energy. Like they, they have marketing budgets. Everybody that owns a business has been told you have to spend money to make money. You have to grow, you know, invest in marketing to grow your business. They don't know how to do it. They know, I mean, to bring, bring it back to phone books, they know that that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And they're kind of waiting and usually they've done some modicum, almost like laughable homemade effort to like, well, I set up my Facebook page and I've got an Instagram profile that's got one picture of my, you know, kid at his baseball game. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm on, uh, I set up a four square page and you're like, well, that was cool. Like five years ago, but right. you, you actually even know what four square does. Yeah. They're like MySpace, right? <laughs> it's, you're, you're like, in a way, you're, you're providing a service that's like, okay, I'm going to pull you into the 21st century, but I'm going to do it in a way that you don't have to get overwhelmed and frustrated with because we both know that when you try to do it yourself, you last about five minutes and you want to like throw your computer out the window. So let's not put you through that again, Mr. Business Owner. How about you just hire me and take it off of me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, uh, but the, the, the cool thing, again, a lot of times businesses are investing in marketing strategies where they think it's working, but they really don't know. They don't know. They, they don't know. You know, they're doing radio ads or television ads and like, okay, it's getting the word out there, but there's no real tangible way to track their results. With social media ads, you can do a coupon for a, a pizza restaurant where, you know, they get a free appetizer. Uh, all they have to do is bring in, you know, their phone with this coupon displayed on it. And so, 
when the business owners see individuals walking in with these coupon codes on their phone, they know it's working. They know right. what you're doing is working. So that's, and when they see it's working, they want to invest more. Yeah. And, and I think the way you present that to them, you say, listen, Mr. Business Owner, I'm not trying to get you to spend money on marketing. I'm trying to get you to save money on marketing. Because right now you're spending 100% of your money on stuff that some of it's working and some of it isn't. Wouldn't it be great if you only had to spend half that much money, but 100% of it was on stuff that you knew was working and you could Absolutely. track and you actually had more stuff working, even though you were spending less money. So don't think of paying me Think of me paying you. I'm going to pay you back all the money that you're currently wasting on marketing you can't track. How's that sound for a deal? That's the pitch right there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so you did that. You got a guy in from church and then you like leaned into the businesses. You realize, hey, there's a business here. Um, clearly, you've come a long way from that to running, you know, I mean, and, and that's a local, right? That's a local model. That's geographically uh, constrained, which frankly makes it a lot easier. It's a lot easier to go on the internet and say, hey, I'm going to help this pizza place win this suburb right. than to say, hey, I'm going to let the, I'm going to help this Jeff Lerner guy win planet earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With his message, right? Yeah. So, so I think that's a great place for people to hear, that people that are listening, it's a great place to start with a local targeted, you know, digital marketing management and, and services because it's, mm -hmm. it gives you a, like a small enough, it's like learning to play baseball in little league. Prove your craft. Being, yeah, Prove exactly. Because yeah. you're in the majors now, though. I mean, you're running ads for, I know, like I'm, I'm one of your probably lesser name clients. I mean, I'm, you're talking guys like, nah, nah. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. But like Ty Lopez, Les Brown, Kevin Harrington, Grant Cardone. I mean, you're, you, you've got kind of the who's who list of people that you've worked with and you currently work with. And so how did you make that leap? Because that's a whole different mm -hmm it's kind of hard to see like, okay, how does the pizza place and the bike shop lead to like the global mega influencer? Like, connect yeah, it, is, for us. it is crazy. I still find myself <laughs> uh, like, oh, how did this happen? I've, and, know, and I have some thoughts, but I want to let you speak first before I take a guess. Yeah. So I, you know, I've, I've had worked with some amazing people, uh, you know, A-list celebrities, fortune 500 companies, some of the top entrepreneurs online, uh, I remember actually getting a phone call from a friend and he was like, Hey, you know, I've got someone that wants to talk to you. It's a really interesting um, situation. And it ended up being the, uh, the prime minister or one of the diplomats for Egypt in connection with the president of Egypt. They wanted me to do some type of tourism campaign um, huh. for them. So, you know, to think of yeah, working with crazy. people like that. It, yeah. From, from the pizza place to the palace, you know, it's yeah. definitely a, a crazy journey, but you know, I guess from the, from the shake shack to the shakes palace. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, I think it's, um, how it really happened. It's kind of hard to like pinpoint, okay, when did this ex exactly happen? But there was a time when I was growing Facebook pages where, you know, that was one of my top things that I did was grow Facebook pages for different businesses and stuff and really learned how to do it well, where I could build a Facebook page to, you know, millions in a really quick time. And I, so I had these Facebook pages that I built that I was, you know, monetizing them, selling t-shirts and cool things like that. But they, you know, they would grow to millions of followers within, you know, a very short time. So businesses and influencers and different companies would reach out to me, ask me to do shout outs for them to help their pages grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I found myself doing that and, I was working with a, uh, a company out in Los Angeles and they did productions of several big movies and I'd help them promote their movies and grow their pages and stuff. And uh, then it was one thing led to another. I get a, a call from this guy and it, I'm talking with him. He's like, yeah, so I understand you grow social media, you help build brands and monetize projects and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's asking me what I would do and just kind of looking for some insight and mm -hmm. kind of showed me some of the stuff that he was doing and uh, just kind of bouncing questions at me. And, and again, I'm 
at this time, I'm just, you know, me and I might have had a couple people on my team, but nobody knew who I was. I mean, it was just like this, uh, this guy working in my home, working with a few different companies here and there. And I really kind of kept to myself and it wasn't like this, this big uh, internet marketing world where everybody's running ads and doing right. things. Uh, so after I got done talking to this gentleman, he called me back 15 minutes later. He said, Hey, I was just wanting to know, uh, could you fly out to Beverly Hills tomorrow? Uh, my brother, Ty Lopez would like to meet with you. And I was like, Oh, okay. And at this time, you know, Ty Lopez has had an incredible journey as a fantastic marketer, but he was kind of in his beginning stages of what he was doing. And so we were still, it was still living in his garage. <laughs> Read his books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so it, it was, it was kind of one of those things where I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, sure. He's like, we'll fly you out here and stuff. I was like, okay, free trip to Beverly Hills. And so I, I flew out there and sat down um, with him and talked with him and showed him what I would do and different things like that. He's like, so when can you start? And I was like, eh. I can start right now. Right. And so from that point, I started working with him, helping him out on various projects and had the privilege of working in, you know, just about every course and speaking at his seminars. And, you know, even during those beginning stages, uh, he, he really kind of pushed me out and he's like, Hey Paul, you need to come speak at this mastermind. You can either. I'm like, what is a mastermind? What is, you know? Huh. And then I remember one time I was sitting at a, a conference and the gentleman was speaking and he was talking about different entrepreneurs and uh, successful individuals online. And he began to talk about Ty Lopez. And he said, something interesting is going on with Ty Lopez. Uh, his growth and his exposure, his brand has just hit all time levels. And he was just, right. you know, begin to talk about it. He was like, uh, we're trying to figure out what he's doing. He's apparently working with someone. We've called him up and he won't tell us who he's working with and stuff. And one of my friends is sitting next to me and he's elbowing me. Yeah, right, he's, right. He's like, they're talking about you. They're talking about you. <laughs> and I just kind of laugh. And I'm like, is it really that big of a deal that people are speaking about this at conferences? And then I, I remember I went up to that gentleman afterwards and I said, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm working with Ty Lopez. I've been working with him for such and such amount of time. And he said, me and my company, we've been trying to figure this out. We, we've seen him grow. We've seen things just blowing up and we're like, what is he doing? How is he doing this? He said, we even had people on our team um, call him up and ask him, you know, who's he working with? And he wouldn't tell us. <laughs> and, and so I thought, yeah, you know, I happen to be working with him. And from that point, I began to, you know, he made introductions to other entrepreneurs and you know I've had the privilege of working with Ty Lopez, Grant Cardone, Bob Proctor, Les Brown, spoke on conferences with Les Brown and you know some of the coolest individuals uh, in the world in the entrepreneur space. Yeah I mean it's an amazing story from the uh, yeah I, I actually really like that from the shakes, Shake Shack to the Shake Palace <laughs> but I mean you know whether it's that or from the from the you know Dodge Caravan to the Beverly Hills Mansion like it's yeah. It's a story that this is the kind of thing that people are like, huh, it yeah, can really crazy. happen. It can yeah. really happen. You yeah. know, and, and, and I think that's what's so important for people to realize is these stories, they all have their origins. Yeah. I has an origin. Grant has an origin. Les has an origin. And none of those origin story. What's amazing is so how, how rarely the origin story is such and such was born. Um, he would, you know, he was groomed to take over his father's company. He was educated at Harvard. He was, you know, yeah. you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book uh, called Outliers. And, and I love think it. it. I One love the book. Books. I love it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But I think that I mean, it really is like, and I, I actually don't disagree with anything about what's in the book, mm -hmm. but I think the way that book has been, uh, frankly, distorted in, in its application to, to popular thought is they're like, oh, see, it's all about who you know and how you're born. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, uh, uh, you know what I mean? But that's not no, what the book says, but that's no, how it's, it's not. It's from the book. So I think if you read the first few chapters, you can walk away like, okay, I guess I'm never going to be successful. But, you know, I, I think one of the 
things that he notes, one of the most brilliant men in the world is working out on a farm by himself because he had no people skills. You know what I mean? So you can be brilliant, but if you don't have people skills, your success may be limited. Uh, So there's different attributes and characteristics of us that, okay, we may not have this, we may not have that, but if we can capitalize on what we do have, anybody can be successful. So let me ask you this, because I want to make a point, but I'm going to tee you up for it. So from the day you decided that you wanted to be an entrepreneur, maybe that was when you were working at Burger King or, you know, the something was like, okay, maybe I'll I'll keep doing what I'm doing to make ends meet, but it's not where my heart is. My heart is building my own thing. Yeah, yeah. How long was it from that day till the day that you got hired by Ty Lopez? Man, it's half my life. <laughs> okay, so like, let's say 15, 20 years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's yeah. my point is, so a lot of people, they would say, oh, Paul got lucky. He got a big break. He got hired by Ty Lopez, right? Yeah. And, and, then, and then they might roll it back and say, oh yeah, but he got hired because he, he had really good skills and he, ha- he has a great, he's a good people person. He developed hard and soft skills. And so he was lucky because of that. And it was like, mm-hmm. well, was he? Okay, so let's roll it back further. Like, what did he have to do to, to acquire those? How many people were in there trying to build Facebook pages when you figured out how to scale them to millions and, and monetize yeah. them for millions and, and started getting all these calls? It's not like you're the only Facebook pages guy in the world at that time. There were thousands, but you were right. a standout there. It's like in everything, you've had to put in years and years to develop standout skills not so that you could have the world open up to you and, and have it all be easy, but just to get to the starting line yeah. of when yeah. it really started to count. Because it sounds like for you, when it really started to count is when now you came on with Ty, now you got to deliver. If you deliver, you can be made, you can get connections with other people, then you're going to have to deliver with them. And like the pressure's on, but like you, you wouldn't have qualified to be in that position, nor would you have been able to perform under that pressure probably if it weren't for the 20 years of getting your ass kicked. Sure, yeah, and, and, and obviously this is the cliff note versions of uh, my story. There was, you know, there was kind of uh, influential people. I worked with a few people in Hollywood before Ty. Sure. And, uh, you know, I worked with some professional- But they, but they didn't hire you if you hadn't performed for someone else before, yeah. who was probably less successful than they were. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think so many people have this idea of like, when's it going to happen for me? It's already yeah. happening. For it me. is happening. Yes, absolutely. How are you showing up? Yeah. yeah. You know, even, even, even when you're knocking on doors and they're getting slammed in your face and you're being told no, it's yeah. happening for you. Yeah. 80% of it is just showing up, just being there. And, you know, you never know who you're going to connect. And, and it is about connecting with the right people. And, yeah. you know, kind of like the, uh, example of me working at the micro engineer company. All I had to do is just show up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I won by showing up. Right. You beat uh, out the, the much guy more qualified guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I won over a more qualified guy simply because mm-hmm. I showed up, I was on time and I did my work. So yeah, when I was, when I was in my early twenties, uh, one of the, the really formative things that happened for me was, I started getting booked to play the piano at some really, really high end private parties. You know, I was a working piano player back then, but all of a sudden this one agency called Gulf coast entertainment, uh, they did all the bookings for like the high society and the corporate galas and stuff in Houston. Like they booked parties for CEOs and billionaires. And I, uh, they, they ended up getting one of my demos and here's the thing. I remember that demo. It was not very good. I didn't play. Very, I'd only been, I didn't start playing until I was 17. This is when I was like 23. Like I was not like, I didn't have decades of experience under my fingers, but yeah. I had a good haircut. Mm-hmm. I had a suit that fit. Yeah. yeah. I was smiling in my headshot. But I didn't find out later that musicians are supposed to look moody and, and, and churlish. <laughs> I just, I was an idiot that just smiled when somebody pointed yeah. a camera at me. Um, yeah. I didn't, I didn't smoke. So I didn't stink like cigarettes. I didn't like rush out every 20 minute break I could get and try to inhale half a pack of cigarettes on the brakes. Like a lot of my musician peers seem to want to do for what, or get high in my car. 
or uh, <laughs> no disrespect to your father's <laughs> previous profession. Like, I just, I just check some of those boxes. Yeah. And literally, yeah. next thing I know, I'm playing private parties for the Secretary of State. I'm playing private parties wow. for the CFO of Enron, which maybe the CFO of Enron was like one of the worst people in the world. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I yeah. Know the time. I'm playing private parties for Tillman Fertitta, the guy that currently owns the Houston Rockets. You know, I, 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 and the guy on the Billion Dollar Buyer Show. I was playing piano in his house 20 years ago when he was just a, a rich restaurateur. Like, these guys would hire me because exactly what you said. I showed up. Right. I was humble. I did the job. I, tr I, I did anything I could do. I went above and beyond. It wasn't just, oh, I'll, I'll play through the breaks. On the breaks, I would go ask the catering manager, hey, is there anything I can do to help out back here? You guys seem like you're kind of slammed. Or I would talk to the, the homeowner beforehand and say, hey, what's your favorite? So what's your wife's favorite song? And I'll make sure to start playing it when she walks in the room and like yeah. anything I could do. Yeah. To be better than my, because the thing is, I was one of the worst piano players in Houston at the time. <laughs> really? I mean, I, I was young. I was competing with guys that were 50. They'd been doing it for 30 yeah. years. Yeah. That's, that's so much of what it takes. And, and as we said, it was happening for me even then. Yeah. No, and, that, uh, that, that, that is, I, I remember I got a job at a dry cleaners and during the interview, at the conclusion of the interview, the hiring manager said to me, he said, I'm going to give you the job. I think you can do this. He said, but one of the main reasons why I'm going to give it to you is because you are the only person that came to the interview wearing a tie. And, you know, as simple as that sounds, just showing up to a job interview, not wearing shorts and a t-shirt actually caused me to rise to the top, I guess. I, I, I mean, as, a, as an employer now, you know, we have a, a team between vendors, contractors, staff, and, and full-time employees. We have about 110 people in our organization now. The only non-negotiable question for us is do they fit the culture? Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll teach skills. We'll, we'll tolerate learning curves. But if you don't fit our culture and you're not committed to our values, you don't even, you don't even get a two-second audition. Yeah, yeah. So important. So important. Um, so let me ask this. I've, I've often wondered this. When did the internet marketing nerd with the, you know, the caricaturized version of Paul, right? The bow tie and the glasses and I mean, the, the suits and I, which I, I know you so well now. It's almost like I don't even see that stuff. But I remember when that's what I saw. Yeah. yeah. When, when did that stuff start to evolve? Okay. So here's the thing is this really is me. I mean, I don't. Yeah. So I wear glasses, bow tie, and, and this is, you know, who, who I am. Uh, but cool. ye years, years ago, uh, when did you realize it was a, it was a useful tool in your marketing arsenal, let's say? Yeah. So, so the, the nerd brand kind of stepped to the forefront. I remember, so my friends have always, you know, uh, called me a nerd. That's, right. you know, I like computers, you know, I like comic books and superheroes and stuff like that. And uh, going to church or business meetings or, or whatever, when I wear a suit, I always, this is, you know, this is a very calm yes. suit for me. This right. is, this is a very conservative, I, but I would wear suits that are very vibrant and uh, my shoes would be kind of like the uh, wing toed uh, shoes and, you know, maybe it, it, so the nerd thing, I got funky socks and stuff and wear glasses because I can't see without them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and, but I used to wear a regular tie, used to wear a regular, regular tie. And one day, one of my friends, he said to me, he was looking at what I was wearing. I must've been wearing a flashy jacket or something. And he cut me my hair and my glasses. He's like, man, you are such a nerd. And he was joking with me, man, you are such a nerd. And I laughed. He's like, you just need a bow tie. And I was like, I was like okay. And so the next time that I saw him, I came wearing a bow tie and he, he, of course I was joking with him and he started laughing. He's like, Oh man, you got the bow tie now. And, uh, I said, yeah, he's like, and then he laughed. He's like, man, it actually, it looks pretty good. It looks, looks sharp. And I don't remember exactly what it was about that day, but it was a good day. Something happened, you know, maybe we got a contract or something like right. that, but it was just something like, I was like, ah. And so the next time I'm like, I'm going to wear, I'm going to wear the bow tie because it brought me good luck. Right. And 
then it's just like the bow tie stuck with me and it, it has become who I am as far as the brand and stuff. I've had people that I connect with and they're like, I don't remember your name. I just know you're the bow tie guy. <laughs> you know? yeah. And so, so I di did realize that there was some value in the, the bow tie and the glasses and kind of just embraced the, the nerdiness of who I am and I have fun with it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's fun. Nerds are fun. It kind of dis disarms people yeah. in business and like, Oh yeah. You know? And uh, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it gives me the opportunity, you know, when I was a kid, I was picked on for being a nerd. Now I like, I embrace it. I'm like, okay, yeah, I am. Let's well, have the thing is, I mean, every superhero squad, Mm -hmm. Every crack detective, you know, if you watch the shows like CSI or whether it's the Avengers, like every team has a nerd. Yeah. yeah you need absolutely. a nerd. Yeah. And so yeah. it's actually a great brand yeah. from that perspective. I think it's super cool that it's actually something you're comfortable as an, as an extension of you. Like you're not, it's not a, it's not a facade. Yeah. But, it, it's, still, it, it, but it's still a character. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it really is. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm a nerdy person. Uh, and but i have fun with it and people like it and you know hey let's 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 do it yeah well i, I mean i can say and i'm speaking you know uh, to our audience here like as you're as you're you know starting to kind of figure out who who you are how you are and what you want to do in this world assuming you're in my audience because you want to do something more or different or expanded from what you're currently doing which is why most of my audience is here um it's really, really important to figure out who you are in the, in the super reductive, digestible way, version of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, like to the market, like, to, like for example, we're friends. To me, you're just Paul. In fact, yeah. there's some other guy that I'm on some list that like his emails come and they say, Paul. Mm -hmm. And every time I see him, I don't, I don't I literally still don't know who this guy is, but just because it says Paul and your Instagram handle is just Paul. <laughs> every time I get this email, I'm like, Oh, Paul emailed me. And then I'm like, wait, no, that's not Paul. That's some other wannabe Paul. But like yeah. to me, you're Paul. You own that yeah. word. I guess you and the apostle Paul, maybe you're like the two Pauls in my life, <laughs> but the two biggest Pauls in the world. <laughs> yeah, right. You're the number two Paul in like, all of history, man. Well, uh, that and that's and maybe John Paul. I don't know. Maybe you guys are like right? John Paul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, we're all competing for the Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but the point is, you've done a really good job of creating a brand that still has plenty of room for you to be yourself. Yeah. But it, it's super easy to digest. You know, in the digital marketing space, for example, I mean, there are a ton of service providers. Mm -hmm. But like, oh, the internet marketing nerds. Or you yeah. need to call my friend the internet marketing nerd. Like, that's just, it just, it works. It, it's, yeah. it's a solid brand. And I think that everybody, it's, you know, it's something I see a lot of people struggle with is like starting to think of themselves as like a commercial product. Yeah, yeah. And like, you, you, don't, you don't have the luxury to be as as complicated yeah. in the market as you are internally. Like we're all complicated. We're humans, but to the market, you have to be really simple to understand. Absolutely. And for you, Paul, the internet marketing nerd with the glasses and the bow tie and the suit and the, the caricature and it all fits. It's like super simple. Yeah. That guy's got something. I'm going to get to know him and then you get to know him. And you're like, Oh, it's great. But um, I think people got to not be embarrassed. Like people are almost embarrassed about yeah. that stuff. But to me, I, what I love about you is you've leaned into it. You own Absolutely. it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it works. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that you have to get a hold of quickly is not everybody's going to like you. And yeah. that's okay. That's okay. You know, if, if you follow me on Instagram, you see I embrace the nerdiness. You know, I also have a side of me that I embrace my faith in God. Mm -hmm. And that is you know, when, when you're starting, you're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't be the, the nerd. Maybe I shouldn't do this because people won't like me and stuff. And then you're like, oh, this is who I am. And I, I remember even, you know, the, the struggle of, okay, say this or don't say that because you want to appeal to everybody. But there's a certain danger when you try to appeal to everybody, 
really you appeal to no one. So you have to embrace who you are, the dynamics, the, you know, your personality, your image, who you are, all the different attributes of yourself. That's who you are. And just put it out there. And there's going to be some people, that, Jeff, you know what, there's going to be people that wouldn't work with me simply because, you know, I'm in my midlife and I've got uh, right. superheroes behind me. Like, I can't take this guy serious. Good. Yeah. I don't want to work with you either. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. You know, so that that's, that's just um, who it is. So if, if you uh, allow yourself to be okay, polarizing or whatever it might be that, okay, there's going to be people that don't work with you. That's all right. You probably don't want to work with them anyways. Yeah. You know, I, I can say that I've taken, I, I've 100% experienced that. I, I used to work worry a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the things that I believe most passionately, I was the most afraid to talk about or to, to allow into the public perception of, you know, for like, as an example, I think that traditional education is for the most part a bankrupt, exploitative, and financially abusive system that sure. dupes people into indentured servitude for decades through student debt and ultimately mm -hmm. even jobs they hate and mortgages they can't afford and all. Like it's all a construct that I think is totally bogus and I think the self-education industry presents a really great alternative path. But in order to articulate that message, I have to talk about things that alienate pretty much anybody that works for a college yeah, things yeah. that don't make me super popular with teachers, yeah. things that don't even make me super popular with a lot of parents, things they don't want their kids to hear. Yeah. And, but I, what I found is the, the less I worry about that, the more I attract the people that are interested in what I actually think and, and yeah. have to share. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty cool. Um, so, okay. We, uh, uh, unfortunately for both of us, I know we, we are about out of time. I want, I mentioned your Instagram. I, I'm still just, blown away that you're just Paul on Instagram. I, I still not totally clear on how you pulled that off. But speaking of how can people go get into your world and soak up some of this uh, amazing value that I will personally vouch for like you want to get into Paul's world. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah. yeah so number one, one of the easiest ways is connecting we connecting with me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is Paul. Just P A U L, not like and you're in the Paul. M Club. In case anybody wonders if you're good at what you do, Paul's in the M Club. That means his Instagram follower count has an M by it. <laughs> A million. A million, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, follow me on Instagram. I'm always in my DMs. Send me a message. Would love to connect with anybody. And what if somebody's interested in, in uh, a professional like your agency or knowing more about your services? Yeah, so uh, connect with my personal website. My personal website is paulgetter.com, paulgetter.com. Uh, you'll see all my information there. You can send me a message. You can uh, connect with our agency, check out my courses, get my book, all that fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, and that's one thing I want to say about you, Paul, is you're not just a, a great service provider. I mean, obviously, I'm super stoked that I can literally hire you to do stuff for me that I don't know how to do. But also, let's assume I didn't have the budget to hire you um, or, or I had more time. You also are such a, a, a fertile creator of value and content and training. Yeah. I could essentially pay a, a pretty small amount of money relative to value and get you to essentially teach me how to do all the stuff that you do. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. M matter of fact, before we jumped on this call and probably when we're done, I'm creating content, just trying to, you know, people ask questions and I'm like, I'm going to make a video for that. And yeah. just trying to help people solve problems and take their business to the next level. Well, again, to, to bring it all back around, you know, I think in a way, whatever it is that people do with a theology degree, traditionally, <laughs> you're probably doing your own version of through your industry because I know your commitment to service, servant leadership, your heart, your desire to just see people thrive and grow and become the best version of themselves and contribute to that in a, you know, business, a professional way if you can. Like I've seen you, I've observed you for a while and I, I think you're a very, let's just say it doesn't surprise me that that's where your, your mind and heart were originally because I think they still are. You're just maybe in a different industry. Thanks a lot, Jeff. I really appreciate that. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I had friends reach out to me during this crazy COVID crisis and, you know, Paul, hey, what do we do? My business and, you know, everything. I was like, just help people. Just help people. Yeah. 
you know, if, if you help people, you'll always be in business. You might have to change the way that you help them, but if you help people solve their problems, you're always going to be in business. I'm letting that hang in the air for a second because <laughs> that's so powerful. It's so true. Um, a- amen to that. Listen, Paul, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being on Millionaire Secrets. I do want to let the audience know, as we always do, we put together a landing page uh, just to acknowledge Paul's appearance here. If you go to millionairesecrets.com forward slash Paul G, you can get our, uh, our digital book, The Millionaire Shortcut, teach you the fastest way to become successful in the new digital economy. Listen to more episodes of the show. Subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. And um, Paul, again, I'm just I'm grateful that I got to have this particular conversation with you that I've I, has probably been uh, a few years in the making. So thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, Jeff. I really appreciate it. You're an awesome person. I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Paul, and thank you to everyone else out there. You are the best part of this show, and why we do what we do. Take care. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.